time, wrong place, mistakes. Cold case, now I chase, no breaks. Unsafe is the faith in the faith. It's a cold case. It's a cold, cold case. You're as sick as your secrets, and a lie can't conceal it. So deep. Welcome to Cold Case MHS, where real education beats real life. I'm your host, Randy Hubbard, an instructor of Cold Case MHS, with my co host, Ashley, and we thank you for listening. With a population of 156, not much seems to happen in the small town of Cedar Grove, Indiana. However, in April of 2013, a woman's remains were found at an unmarked dump site in the town. A man named Andy Hicks was looking for scrap metal when he stumbled across what appeared to be a human jawline. Nearby, he also found a human skull in a Kroger bag, as well as a handful of other bones. These remains would be sent to Indianapolis and Cincinnati for testing and the woman had been identified as 21-year-old Caitlin Markham from Fairfield, Ohio. Although a manner of death had yet to be determined, her passing had been ruled a homicide. 25 miles east of Cedar Grove is Fairfield, Ohio. Just 20 months earlier, Caitlin Markham was living in Fairfield, anticipating her 22nd birthday just days away. She was a student at the Art Institute of Ohio and was a few months from graduating. She was hardworking and determined, managing two jobs at once. Caitlin had been with her fiancé, John Carter, for six years. They'd been engaged for a year and had plans to move to Colorado together after her graduation. So it seemed like she had a lot of things to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, they were literally going to move to Colorado, mm -hmm. and the only thing they were waiting on was just for her to graduate, mm -hmm. and then they were ready to start their new life together. So this seems like all the other stories that we've heard about during our podcast. What we hear a bunch is young people with a lot of potential and things to look forward to in their life taken from us too soon. In Caitlin's case, she was found far from home and in a dirty area, but the things that we just heard about her seems like she's very clean cut, she's very put together, she has her life planned out for herself. So we just assume that she would never be found in a situation where she could be in danger. From the research, we know that John and Caitlin and some of their friends attended a local festival the Friday before she went missing. Yeah, this is a yearly festival, and it's like any other festival. There's a lot of food, games to play, and there is some drinking, but some people also use it to do illegal drugs. This is a potential risk factor that we have to take into consideration when discussing a case like Caitlin's. Um, and Caitlin, despite being tired, she was persuaded by her fiancé, John, to attend the festival that Friday night, along with a few of their friends. And it was reported by some of their friends that John and Caitlin got into a dispute at the festival, um, and this was apparently over John having spent $100 on raffle tickets, which had upset Caitlin. However, some of the friends claimed that John and Caitlin seemed fine that night. And later, while being interviewed, John admitted that he did spend $100 on raffle tickets, but that Caitlin didn't mind. He said, quote, she thought it was a good idea, she was okay with it, end quote. So it seems like she might have been like a little upset because $100 for raffle tickets is a little much, but... I feel like that's not too big of a deal, you know? Yeah, I think, like, especially if they were planning to get married, they would definitely be in money-saving mode, but I think True. at the end of the day, it was something she didn't want to pick a fight over. Yeah. So I can see both sides of the argument of, like, whether she was okay with it or whether she was annoyed. Yeah. Saturday morning, the next day, Caitlin shows up to work on time. Her shift at David's Bridal in Cincinnati Tri-County Mall, one of her three jobs, ended at 8 p.m., John had stated that he arrived at Caitlin's townhome around 7.30 or 8 p.m. Although she was at work at this time, he had his own key and was able to enter the townhome. Caitlin's co-workers stated that they all left together around 8.25 p.m. Given the distance between her townhome and the Tri-County Mall, Caitlin should have arrived home around 8.40 to 8.45 p.m., assuming she went straight home. According to John, Caitlin was tired from her shift at work, but the two decided to take magic mushrooms together. At about 9 p.m., a male friend of Caitlin's came over. This friend claimed to sense tension between Caitlin and John, noting that Caitlin was glued to her computer and wasn't socializing much. 
He also stated that John was talking for Caitlin and that she seemed to be in a bad mood. But according to John, they spent a normal night together watching TV and there, there wasn't any kind of argument between the two of them. Well, I don't know how people like act on mushrooms. Like, I don't know like the right. behavior, but maybe she was just like really high and like didn't want to talk to anybody. It seemed like that's what he was trying to imply in interviews, that it was like anything about her being quiet or being weird was just like effect of the mushrooms. Like but the mushrooms. then when you kind of put the timeline together, they would have had to like straight home mushrooms yeah. because in order for it like to have effect on her, given that the time that this was was about like 9 p.m. the friend came over yeah. and she got home at like 8.45, like, I don't know how much that lines yeah. up. I don't know. It was reported that this friend left around 10 p.m. And for three weeks after this night, John never mentioned that this friend had come over. So three weeks, like, into the investigation, he didn't right. say it? He, he never mentioned. Wow, that's really suspicious. Yeah, because it would have been, this was the night before she disappeared. This was, like, the last yeah, night like she important. was seen. It's definitely important. John ended up leaving Caitlin's house between 11 p.m. and midnight. From there, he went to Hamilton, Ohio, where about six or seven friends were hanging out. And when John left her house, he was the last person to see Caitlin alive. But after he left, the two continued to text each other up until around 1 a.m. Okay, so she lives in Fairfield. How long does it take to get from Fairfield to well, it's about five miles, oh, so okay. it was really close, at least to where the friend's house was. Okay. This house had a fire pit, and according to John, Caitlin had requested for him to bring a bag full of papers and documents. It was old bills, bank schedules, class schedules that she didn't want to take out to the trash, and apparently it was John's mother who had suggested the idea to her, based on a financial magazine article that stated how long different types of documents should be kept. And according to his mother, it wasn't rare for the couple to have people over for bonfires, and since they didn't have a shredder, this was the best option to get rid of papers. Caitlin was texting John while he was burning the papers, and even said over text, quote, oh, I kind of wanted to be there for it, but that's okay, end quote. Hmm, so it seems almost like she was burning something to hide something, maybe? Right, and for a while when I was reading, before I read that quote, um, just hearing that John had brought up this bonfire so often, it almost sounded like he was trying to say Caitlin had so much that she was, like, getting rid of this uh -huh. night. And that's definitely a sign you see in people who are planning to disappear. Yeah, like, he really emphasized on the fact that she really wanted to burn those papers. Right. And he even consoled her by saying that they could burn some of his papers the following night. See, that's kind of weird to me because, like, for me, at the on the first day of summer, I have a bonfire and I, like, burn all my homework and stuff. Right, yeah. So that's kind of exciting, like, in that sense, but I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely, like, she almost was letting go of something. Yeah, but. yeah. Although what they're saying could be a potential explanation for all this, we do have to consider that we know that Caitlin and John were planning on moving, and they don't have any other convenient means of disposing of papers. Like they said, they didn't have a shredder. So it could just be that they were using the fire because it was convenient to them, and it could be symbolic for them. It could be important to them because they are moving on and they're starting a new life. Yeah, and when I moved to my new house, one of the things we did was stood outside and got rid of all of our old papers in our fire pit. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there was something bad going on. It just, they're moving on. According to law enforcement, Caitlin's phone communicated with the cell tower for the last time at 1245 on Sunday, and this was the last account of the phone being active. However, there are many possibilities as to what could have been the reason for this inactivity. It could have been turned off, damaged, or it's possible that the battery was removed. Um, the GPS was also turned off, but we don't know if this was done manually or as a result of the phone being shut down or destroyed. But according to her family, Caitlin was always on her phone and almost had an attachment to it. So it wasn't like she like stopped using her phone, it's like the phone shut off completely? Right. Okay. Like, once it stops communicating with the cell tower, that means it's like okay. you can't use that phone anymore. Okay. That's weird. 
John Carter received the last text from Caitlin at 12.52 a.m., and it was a photo taken of Caitlin by her boss. John quoted this exact time, 12.52, for weeks in interviews. However, when he was asked on The Nancy Grace Show, his last interview with the public, he said, quote, I can't remember, 12.45, 12.50 something, end quote. Following this, there were inconsistent accounts from his stepsisters on what the time was. Which I feel like that would have to be a time that like sticks in your mind. Like this yeah. is the last time he ever got any word from her. Their last contact mm-hmm. ever. It's twelve fifty two a.m. Especially because it was his last interview, so he would have been like, "Yeah, it was this time." Because think of it's the amount of times in your he, mind. Yeah, he, was, yeah. he had been asked what was the last time, and he had been saying it for weeks. So it's just, yeah, it could definitely be seen as suspicious. Yes. We are in no way accusing John of committing these crimes. Although there's a lot of things that he did that make him look suspicious, we haven't been in that situation, so we don't know how we would react. Most of the information that we do have is coming from John. So everything that he says or he puts out, we're going to microanalyze and we're going to say, this is suspicious because he worded it like this, because that's all the information that we do have to go off of. It's also unclear what time it was on Sunday morning when John left the friend's house. Accounts vary around 3 a.m. But upon leaving the house, he went home where he watched some TV and sent Caitlin a good morning text around 4 a.m., assuming she would see it when she woke up. So he went back to his house? Yes, okay. he went back to his house. Okay. And he lived very close to Caitlin. Okay. John woke up on Sunday at 4.30 p.m., but this was normal for him to sleep in so late because he worked late hours as a Papa John's driver. <laughs> His shift that day didn't start until 5 p.m. He noticed that Caitlin hadn't responded to the text that he'd sent, but he figured that she had just missed it. But John was a little bit concerned about not having heard from Caitlin for so long, which is what he said in interviews. Um, however, he had two different routes that he could take to work, equal distances, Yet that day, he drove the route that didn't pass by Caitlin's house. Hmm. So if it was in his mind that, like, he wanted to check up on her, she hasn't responded to his text, I just feel like it's normal for him to drive past her house. Right. Hmm, interesting. That Sunday, Caitlin had a shift at David's Bridal from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Unfortunately, she did not show up to work, and she did not call in. John stated that he texted her continually from the time he woke up and attempted to call her. However, he never called David's bridal, despite his assumption that she would be at work. According to John's mother, this was because David's bridal employees are not allowed to answer calls or messages during work. Which is interesting because this would mean that John had no reason to worry about his texts and calls being unanswered. Mm, true. Right, and if he like was so concerned, if there was something in his mind saying, I need to check up on her, he could have called... David's David's bridal. bridal. Yeah. However, John starts to get more and more concerned about Caitlin, and a few hours into his shift, he asks for permission to leave and check on her. So between 7 and 7.30, John arrives at Caitlin's home and sees her car, purse, and keys, but he doesn't see Caitlin or her phone. So the thing that seems strange to me is that everything that is personal to her was still there except for her phone, and the phone can be really important in a situation like this. Right, so if it's not there, we can't look at her past messages, calls, timestamps, or cell phone tower pings, which makes it really difficult to find out where she was, who she was talking to, and all that kind of stuff that can be really important when trying to figure out the details of her case. It's almost as if he was trying to hide where she was. Right. Hmm. So there's a few quotes he gave regarding seeing her car in the driveway at her house. He said that it made him worry, he had a feeling something was going on, his heart sank, he freaked out, he panicked. And he was thinking, quote, oh my god, she might be gone, quote. Hmm, So he said she might be gone, but her car was there. See, if I was concerned about someone who wasn't answering my text and I decided to go to their house and I see their car, I'd be like, okay, maybe she's still inside, maybe she's hurt, maybe she... Um, I don't know, something happened to her, but I wouldn't, like, think automatically, oh my gosh, she's gone. Right. You know? Especially gone, like, that's a weird, that's a weird word to use, Yeah, if the car was gone, then I'd be like, okay, she left. Like, something's wrong. So, he said that the reason he gave this reaction 
um, including in his 911 call, is that her car was supposed to be at work, so seeing the car at home was a sign that something was wrong. There was one interview where he said that he went to her house at this time from 7 to 7.30 um, because he expected her to be getting home from work at this time. But then it's weird because why would you be alarmed that there, that her car is there? True. She's arriving. Yeah. Like her, her shift ended at 7. Yeah. He doesn't have a real reason to assume that she never showed up to work. Yeah. No one told him True. that she hadn't. Mm -hmm. So upon entering her home, um, he doesn't see Caitlin, but he doesn't see any signs of struggle or forced entry, nothing really that's unusual. The only thing is her dog was shut into their second floor bedroom instead of the first floor bathroom, and that's normally where the dog would be when she was out. Oh. I feel like that's really telling. Like, yeah. So when, whenever she like leaves to go to work, she always puts the dog in the bathroom? Is that what it is? Yeah. But it was upstairs? Right, so that means that she was not planning on going out. Yeah. The dog had also peed in the bedroom, so that showed John Carter that Caitlin had not been home for some time. Yeah, he was in there for a while. So at this point, he, quote, freaked out and immediately called friends, family, police, including his mother and Caitlin's father. There was a report from one of these friends um, who goes by Princess Mary Catherine on Facebook that he had called her before calling 911 and John told her that Caitlin hadn't gone to work that day. Which- But if her shift ended at seven- Right, I, I think it's, the thing with the dog could definitely yes, point towards yeah. her having not gone to work, but it hasn't been confirmed. Yeah. So the fact How that he would he already know? be saying this yeah. is a little strange. And then the timeline with when he called 911 um, and the facts that he was giving is kind of messed up. So he said that when he called 911 at 7.58, he said that he was heading there now in regards to but her But he was already there. But basically, by his own account, John had to have known that Caitlin was missing between 7 and 7.30, find her purse and her keys, everything was still there, leave her town home, then call 911 on the way back 30 to 60 minutes later. Because in the 911 call, he said that he was heading there now, but I don't think he had mentioned that he had already been to her house. Why would he leave her house though? So exactly, he, so like he, why would he, he have went to his, He went to her house, saw all her stuff was missing, freaked out, and then left her house, called all her friends, family, and then yeah. and, and some reason came back, called 911 and said, I think my girlfriend's missing or whatever. Yeah, he said that he needed to like call or like communicate with friends who didn't have phones, I guess. Like he needed to go in person and talk to people, which is. But I feel like that's not really like, yeah, it's you need to tell the people who are friends with her and stuff like that. But at that point, you, you need, need to, to stay the there. Yeah. Right. Why would you leave? Yeah. So although I kind of understand what they're saying, I think that we're kind of, again, microanalyzing everything he's doing. So I think it might not be as suspicious as we think it is because maybe in his mind he's thinking, oh, maybe she's just out with friends or like you don't want to think the worst about a situation. You don't want to be like, oh, immediately she's missing. You want to think about maybe she's with her friends, maybe she's with her family, maybe she's somewhere she just forgot to text or forgot her purse or something. And in the 911 call, he did mention that there were, quote, a lot of questionable people, end quote, at the Sacred Heart Festival that had just happened. So sometime during the investigation, John Carter did have to take a lie detector test um, that was given to him by the police. And before he even got any sort of feedback on how this went, he posted on his Facebook wall, quote, went in and took a voice lie detector, didn't do very well very nervous hmm. so I know like lie detector tests aren't admissible in court so you can't really like I don't know I feel like the nerves and stuff like that would be very easy to know on lie detector tests but still why would you say that yeah I don't know and then post it on your Facebook like but then when he went to the Nancy Grace show Nancy Grace asked him if he had taken a, a polygraph 
and he said yes. She asked if he had passed it, and he also said yes. I don't know. That's kind of fishy. Like, if I was taking a lie detector test because my girlfriend went missing, I would, first of all, not, like, make that public information. Yeah, it shouldn't be. Like, two days later, the chief of police of Fairfield had been asked on, um, on the radio in an interview to, to confirm or deny whether John Carter had taken a polygraph test. Mm-hmm. He didn't confirm or deny, and much less, like, he didn't say anything about him yeah. passing it either. Yeah. Later, John Carter's family issued a statement saying that he had taken a voice stress analysis test, but mistakenly he had thought it was a polygraph, and that's why he said everything that he did. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that people want to point to in regards to John Carter, um, but that's mainly because he was obviously the closest person to Caitlin. He had been with her for six years. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't any evidence of abuse or domestic violence between the two of them, and he didn't have a criminal history. John never even got a lawyer because, According to him, he hadn't done anything wrong, so there is no reason for him to be worried enough to need a lawyer. An interesting thing about this case was that it was brought up again um, in 2018 when a man named Michael Strauss was convicted for the murder of Ellie Wyke. So a little bit on Michael Strauss. So basically, he was sentenced to 17 and a half years to life in prison for stalking, murder, and gross imposition of a corpse on Ellie Wyke. Um, Her remains were found near his home in Liberty Township. Uh, He stalked her from February to July by using like a multitude of aliases and a bunch of like chat messaging apps and like talking to her all like all this creepy stuff. And then um, he supposedly claimed while he was in prison to have killed another woman, but they still have yet to find out details on that. And then he also admitted to stalking a female jogger around his home. So recently there's been new developments in the case, and Michael Strauss's name came up again. It didn't necessarily come up as somebody that's a possible suspect in her murder, but it came up because the guy that was arrested by the name of Jonathan Palmerton was actually arrested for perjury, which means he lied to the investigators about Caitlin Markham's case or something else, but it's led to a new investigation into her case. And the reason that Michael's name was brought up is because him and John are friends. What's really weird is that him, John Palmerton, and John Carter were all friends as well. And there's pictures of them together and things like that. Now, this new information has actually created a situation where they have served two search warrants. One at John Palmerton's old home where he used to live. And the other one is actually at John Carter's old home, which is the fiance of Caitlin Markham. Now, I don't know if they're going to arrest anybody here soon. I don't know if John Palmerton is considered to be a suspect or if if he's just somebody who is connected to the case. We won't know that for a while because they're not going to give out that information. But I will say that Ryan Green, um, he's a private investigator that was called in to talk about the case, stated in a podcast called Gone at 21, that John Palmerton was one of the first people that showed up to John Carter's house when Caitlin Markham was reported uh, missing. So it's kind of weird, those connections. Uh, What's kind of good about this situation is now the case is reopened and it looks like some things are moving forward. Shortly after we recorded that update on Caitlin's case, At the end of that podcast, some more news has come out just recently. Our students who worked on Caitlin's case were from the class of 2021 and 22, and they've since moved on to college. They spent all year looking into Caitlin's case and her disappearance. There have been many podcasts, reports, and articles about Caitlin, and suspicion has always kind of hovered over her fiance, John. Earlier, we gave you an update of a person who was arrested for perjury in relation to Caitlin's case. Again, suspicion went back to John when a search warrant was served at his mother's house where he used to live when he was engaged to Caitlin. On March 22, 2023, 12 years after her disappearance and 10 years after her remains were found, 
John Carter was arrested in relationship to the murder of Kaylin. Although the prosecutor isn't releasing much information about the case, it appears justice for Caitlin may be just around the corner. For her father Dave Markham and sister Allie, they may be able to rest a little easier knowing that people didn't give up and someone will be held accountable for those crimes. I would like to thank Anna and Grace for their hard work on this case. I'd also like to thank Ashley, my co-host, who continues to make this a great podcast. I would also like to thank Jessica Schmidt from Fox 19 News. She has helped us immensely with my class, but she also does a great job in reporting these types of crimes. I'd like to thank Fairfield Police Department and Butler County Sheriff's Office for not giving up on Caitlin's case. I'd also like to thank Ryan Green, the private investigator who has spent a lot of time on this case. I think his work has helped turn this into what it is today. The artwork for this podcast was created by former student Emma Holbert. The theme song Cold Case was written and performed by former student Jenna Brandt and was produced by Noria. The ending theme song, which will be used for season three, is called Believe Me by current student Alexa Dahl. Thank you for listening to Cold Case MHF. Please tune in next time to episode nine, Something Suspicious. The murder of Wendy Berkey. Believe me, it won't happen again. All those things that you said weren't true. You told me that we'd always be friends, but then what you did. You said you had enough back, but instead you attack. You got me out of my head. We won't go and solve this time. We'll catch you, and your crimes will be shining the light on you. You had no back, but instead you attack. You got me out of my head. We won't go and solve this time. We'll catch you, and your crimes will be shining. You said you had